Franz Birkenau and Derrida, Chapter 4. Returning from this typifying framing of Derrida's approach, I would like to suggest a further contextualization of his oeuvre that brings us closer to the philosopher's text once more. This time, we are dealing with a great tale of the responses of civilizations to death as detailed by the brilliant cultural historian Franz Birkenau, a thinker with a wide-ranging interdisciplinary approach in his posthumously published Historico-Philosophical Magnum Opus, End and Beginning, on the Generations of Cultures and the Origin of the West. The confession by Derrida quoted at the start namely that he held two completely opposing convictions as to his continued presence as an author, simultaneously or alternatively, reminds me directly of the fundamental thesis of Birkenau's historical speculation. Born in Vienna and of half-Jewish descent, Birkenau had turned to communism early on after a strict Catholic upbringing, he was intermittently a functionary of the Western European office of the Calm in turn, then a fellow at the Institute of Social Research in Frankfurt. After his abandonment of communism, he became one of the earliest critics of what he called totalitarianism in his work The Totalitarian Enemy, was published in London in 1940, more than a decade before Hannah Arendt, put her stamp on the subject with the political bestseller, The Origins of Totalitarianism. In his cultural philosophy, he deals with the opposing stances of cultures towards death. While one type of culture rejects death and reacts to it with the doctrine of immortality, the other type of culture accepts the fact of death and develops a culture of committed worldliness on the basis of this. Borkenau referred to this bipolar opposition as the antimony of death. It represents the cultural formulation of the dual stance towards death found with more or less clear routines in every individual, that one's own death is certain, but as such remains incomprehensible. Borkenau's ambition as a macro-historian was to use his doctrine of the opposing yet interconnected attitudes of cultures towards death to disprove the historico-philosophical doctrine of Oswald Spengler, who argued that every culture arises like a windowless monad from its own unmistakable primal experience. Today, we would call it a primary irritation flourishing and declining in an exclusive, endogenously determinate life cycle without any real communication between cultures. In reality, Birkenau posits cultures join to form a chain whose individual links are connected according to the principle of opposition to the respectively preceding link. This is the meaning of his reference to cultural generations. Uh, just a moment. Oswald Spengler, I think, was a deep influencer and debater with Heidegger. And you can see a lot of uh, Heideggerian themes in Birkenau's work. Regardless, it is not surprising that Birkenau was unable to expand these ambitious concepts into a general cultural history. At most, he was able to give reasonably convincing accounts of a single chain of cultural generations. Not just any chain, however, but rather the sequence in which the main protagonists of the Occidental cultural drama were involved. The series inevitably begins with the Egyptians, whose construction of the pyramids, mummifications, and extensive cartographies of the hereafter from a lasting and impressive monument to their obsession with immortality. The antithesis of Egypticism was developed by the subsequent culture of death acceptance that we refer to as antiquity, including the Greeks and Jews, and in the second rank, also the Romans. Among these peoples, enormous mental energies that had been bound through the work of immortalization under the Egyptian regime and the Indus Valley civilizations were freed up 
for alternative tasks. These could consequently be used to shape political life in finite time. This may be one of the reasons why the invention of the political can be viewed as the joint achievement of an ancient Mediterranean cultures of mortality. It is quite revealing that in this respect, there is no real difference between the poles of Athens and Jerusalem. A very important theme that we always refer to Habermas on, and that's why I think it's really important to shift that uh, Athens and Jerusalem to Washington and Beijing today, <laughs> which are normally played off against each other. Both function according to the tenet that public life in morally substantial communities or among productively cooperating citizens, assemblies can only come about if people are not constantly thinking about survival of their bodies or souls in the hereafter, but rather have their minds and hands free for the task of the polis and the empirical communio. The excessive grip of political citizens' assemblies on the lives of mortals inevitably resulted, according to Birkenau, in a new immortalist reaction. So here we can see a little bit of Max Weber pointing his head out, where individuals die, but the offices of the polis are immortal. So the immortality shifts. So in a new immortalist reaction, it led with the mediation of a barbaric interlude to the start of the Christian era in the Western Europe. On account of its new emphasis on immortality, Christian culture, though there is some uncertainty as to the aptness of the cultural concept, quite obviously constituted the grandchild of Egyptianism, though it now made the immortality of the soul its focus. The Catholic cult of relics alone forms an indirect continuation of the Egyptian concern for the eternal body, but Christian immortalism, according to Birkenau's schema, in turn provided in its own antithesis through its excesses, the modern age, beginning with the Renaissance, was once again a culture of a death acceptance, and again led to the investments of human energies in political projects, and I would say socio-economic or projects as well. One of these, in keeping with the fundamental techniques or technical characteristics of modernity was the alliance of empowerment and facilitation of life, which would ultimately lead to the consumer society of today. Exactly, that's what I was thinking. In the chain of cultural affiliations, modernity would therefore be the grandchild of antiquity, hence Eo Epso, the great grandchild of Egypt. Their common choice to accept death would then supply the deeper reason for the oft-noted resonance between them. It is this choice that one would find the motifs that made a paradigmatic author of the modernity such as Freud feel so conspicuously at home in the company of ancient philosophers, Stoics, Epicureans, and skeptics alike. The appeal of Birkenau's model obviously lies not so much in its capacity for historical explanation, which clearly remains precarious, nor would his aim of supplying an alternative to Spengler still be considered an attractive one today. What makes these speculative reflections on the antimony of death current and fruitful is the fact that they do not present the transition from a metaphysical to a post-metaphysical semantics as a form of evolutionary progress or a deepening of logic. Instead, they declare it the effect of an inevitable epochal fluctuation based on an objectively irresolvable antinomy or an inescapable and irreducible double truth. Derrida's position within this fluctuation initially seems the same as Freud's, which positions itself clearly on the side of the modern extreme. 
with the ancient Jewish and Hellenic cultures allied within it. What the philosopher calls deconstruction is initially no more than an act of the most thorough semantic secularization, semiological materialism in action. One could describe the deconstructionist method as a guide to returning the churches and castles of metaphysical immortalist ancien regime to the mortal citizens. The strange thing about the approach, however, is that Derrida, to continue the architectural imagery, does not believe in the power of modernity's exponents to create authentic new buildings. As his conversation with Peter Eisman and the Viennese architectural group Ku Himlebau show fairly ambiguously, he always remained distant from the world of modern architecture and used such terms as constructing slash deconstructing purely metaphorically without ever developing a material connection to the practice of building truly contemporary, that is, demystified edifices free of historical baggage. He apparently had some the same tendency, symbolically speaking, as people who are condemned always to live in old houses or even haunted castles, even if they think they are residing in the neutral buildings of the present. That's funny. There's a lot of jokes in here. For him, it is clear that even in the quarters of modern people, the undead from the otherworldly era walk in and out, just as one god from Egypt never stopped casting his shadows across the huts of the post-Mosaic Jews. And I, I call those ghosts interdimensional beings. <laughs> they, they totally exist. Okay. In my view, one of the virtues of Birkenau's, and that's why we end with Boris Groys, by the way. In, what, in my view, one of the virtues of Birkenau's model lies in the fact that it helps to understand the complexity of Derrida's position a little more clearly. For although Derrida paid tribute to the mortalist choice in the modus operandi of his analysis, the choice is so characteristic of Judeo-Greek culture and its modern grandchild, he always retained a connection to Egyptian immortalism and, to a much lesser extent, also the Christian form. The connection did not revolve purely around enlightenment or exorcism, However, Derrida did not simply want to drive away the ghosts of the immortal list past. He was rather concerned with revealing the profound ambivalence resulting from the realization that both choices are equally possible and equally powerful. Hence, the pathos of his confessions according to which one could never fully leave the realm of metaphysics or ontotheology. Essentially, however, Derrida always insists on his right always to retain his metaphysical incognito. He does not want an entry in his passport under unchangeable features, reading Jewish denier of immortality, let alone crypto-Egyptian follower of overcoming of death. One can, in a certain sense, therefore regard Derrida as a philosopher of freedom, though certainly not in the tradition of the old European idealisms. And that's I should have said that in my last conversation about this push towards emancipation. His discrete idea of freedom is inseparable from the effort to withdraw constantly from the initially inevitable identifications and pinning downs as associated with the use of certain idioms Thank you. Thank you, Slaughterdyke. I love you, Slaughterdyke, for just using the word idioms right here and criticizing it. <sighs> Slaughterdyke is actually the best. Oh, thank you. I love you, Slaughterdyke. Okay, all right, back to certain use of idioms, which incidentally is why some readers seek to label him a neo skeptic who like the members of that school, declared a state of suspension between different opinions the highest intellectual virtue. 
if skepticism initially expresses no more than a reluctance to choose between the dogmatic teaching systems of antiquity, the Platonic, the Aristotelian, the Stoic, and the Epicurean, then Derrida is more than a mere skeptic. His constitutive fluctuation relates not to alternative philosophical doctrines, but rather to the pre-philosophical choice of the antimony of death and his fluctuation incorporates the simultaneously necessary and impossible choice between metaphysics and non-metaphysics. The word fluctuation, and I love how Sloterdijk uses a word and then goes back and deconstructs his own work, so you can see that he is indeed indebted to Derrida. The word fluctuation should not, of course, be taken as a reference to a personal indecision. It is rather an indication that the situation involves a choice whose opposing oppositions or opposing options can be viewed from both sides by the chooser. When the thinker chooses, he not only senses the injustice he has done towards the rejected option, he also notices that the trap around him is closing. Whoever chooses exposes themselves to the risk of identification, which is precisely that Derrida was always most concerned to avoid. Perhaps one could view deconstruction primarily as a method of defending intelligence against the consequences of one-sidedness. It would then amount to an attempt to combine membership in the modern city of mortals with an option in favor of Egyptian immortalism. If the deconstructionist use of intelligence is preventative measure against one-sidedness, however, its successful application becomes particularly important when preparing for one's own end. For Derrida, who as an unidentified thinking object. This is funny because he's Slaughterdyke is identifying Derrida as the unidentified thinking object. Was always already to answer to his students, friends, and opponents as a present partner. The preservation of this sovereign indecision came at the price of having to keep the option of a double burial open for himself for the time of his absence. One would take place in the earth of the country he had inhabited critically, the other in a colossal pyramid that he himself had built in a lifetime's work on the edge of the desert of letters. Amazing. This being on the edge of the desert is where we actually can find progress, right? This is one of the points I make in my ritual, ritual Traces series, how we are building our societies in the middle of the desert. But when we look at the edge of the desert, um, the edge of the desert being between the cave, the Plato's cave and the desert, is where we can find the best critiques of our own ideologies. And perfectly, we move into Regis Dupri and Derrida.